Have you discovered the Green Conspiracy's new garden planner? Now is the moment to get yourself on board with this handy new way to organise your entire gardening year. This stylish book is the perfect one-stop shop for all your gardening notes, plans and calendars. Its simple but smart template and drop-dead gorgeous style make this the notebook you'll want by your side as you plan your gardening year, whether that's caring for your houseplants or growing a whole garden full of edibles. The Green Conspiracy's Kickstarter campaign is now on and runs until March the 7th, so don't miss out on your chance to support this brilliant product. It's the work of two graphic designers who found growing plants was the perfect way to get away from their screens and the hustle and bustle of city life. But will it work for you? Well, I've tested out a prototype and I love it. And I think you will too. Visit thegreenconspiracy.com to find out more and get your growing year started in style. On the Ledge podcast is back. It's episode 84 and I am your host, Jane Perone. You know what? This week, I don't know whether it's Christmas or Easter. It may be partly because I've had a week off the podcast and I'm not quite back in the groove yet. But it's also because in this week's show, we're talking about Christmas, Easter and indeed Thanksgiving cacti. I've got expert grower Mark Preston on hand to answer my questions about the differences between these groups of plants and finding out some top tips on how to get them to flower, not drop their buds and generally look fabulous in our homes. This is actually the first part in a two-part interview because Mark had so much interesting stuff to say that I'm bringing him back in episode 85 to talk about the other members of the Ripsalidae clan. That's Hatiora, Ripsalis and Lepismium. Also, in today's show, I'm going to be answering a question about spider plant babies. That's Chlorophytum commosum and its little offspring, or as I heard them charmingly referred to recently, spiderettes. Thanks to my new Patreon subscribers this week, Amelia, Richard and Jacqueline all became ledge ends, donating $5 a month or more to the On The Ledge cause and unlocking exclusive extra content, while Thomas and Adam both became crazy plant people, donating a dollar a month for that warm, fuzzy feeling of supporting the show. And thank you to all of them, because it really makes a difference. In fact, if every single one of you listening became a crazy plant person, it would basically free me up to spend all of my working day on On The Ledge and in the process make the show even better. Do consider donating just a dollar a month if you're able to do so. My goal is to get 100 patrons by the time my 100th episode rolls around, which will be sometime in June. I only need about 10 more to reach this goal. And when I do, every patron, regardless of the tier they're in, will be getting an exclusive digital artwork celebrating the show. So please do consider signing up. Find out all the info you need at janeperone.com. If you'd prefer to give a one-off donation, that's fine too. You can do that via co-fi.com. Again, details on my website. But now let's crack on with my interview with Mark Preston. Mark Preston is an expert on epiphytic cacti and a member of the British Cactus and Succulent Society, one of my favourite plant societies in the UK. And he's regularly to be found at meetings of the BCSS giving talks on these wonderful plants. So it was a delight to chat to him about Christmas, Easter and Thanksgiving cactus, the Schlumbergerers and more. But I started off by asking how he got into this whole plant thing in the first place. Well, I, I think I, I began um, to have an interest in plants when I first had a tropical fish tank, actually. And gradually, I became more interested in the plants themselves than the fishes. And conveniently, my parents had just started having a, um, a conservatory built on the back of their house. And I started trying to propagate plants. And I think my interest really started from from that. Um, 
it waned a bit. Well, I did botany at university, um, but other than that, I didn't grow so many plants at, for a few years. We moved house, had children, and I've gradually come back to it um, as the children have got older and I've had more time to indulge. So I'm actually now getting back into the sort of things that I was growing maybe 40 years ago. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? That's a good good feeling when you can kind of rediscover past loves and embrace your hobby fully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th- I think so. And also, th- things have moved on in some ways, but in other ways, it's all exactly as it was. Um, I, I, in, in the 60s and 70s, there was actually a lot of new plant material coming in, some of which has been quite difficult to obtain over the last 20, 30 years, I think. And it, it's interesting that some of those plants are now coming back. Well, indeed. And that's why I've got you here today to talk about this subsection of the epiphytic cacti family which is not really i don't think a, a, a botanical definition really is it it's just a, a loose it's grouping not a, not a natural group no but the ones we're, we're talking about today is there an umbrella name for this group of epiphytic cacti or are they just this lot <laughs> what do we call them <laughs> Well, they they belong to a tribe of um, called the Ripsalidae, which is, is one of a number of tribes within um, the cactus family that have epiphytic cacti. Um, but these ones are probably the uh, most extreme epiphytes, if you like. Um, they tend to be smaller. Um, they tend to be uh, slower growing, perhaps uh, more adapted to extreme epiphytic conditions generally. And some of them do make quite good house plants. In this group, there are some real, very extremely popular plants which uh, are still widely grown and, in fact, are, are coming back into fashion. So we've got the Christmas cactus, the Easter cactus, the rip, the Ripsalis, which you've, which is obviously a subset of of that tribe, uh, Lepismium and Hatiora. Is that my? Is that the the full list? I think I think so. I mean, the the names change. Uh, they've changed fairly frequently throughout the last century, but uh, that has been given another boost as a result of the molecular analyses that have been done over the last 10, 15 years. But uh, yes, we're, we're into about five different genera at the moment within the Ripsalidae. And I guess we should probably start with the Christmas and, ca- and Easter cacti. There's so much confusion around this, this group of plants uh, online. There seems to be so much conflicting information about, oh, well, that's a Thanksgiving cactus and that's a this and that's a... And I'm, get, I'm still a bit confused, I have to be quite honest, about exactly what I should be calling these things and how they're all different. <laughs> can you, can you, you clear up alone. any confusion or... <laughs> I'm not alone. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> but yes. Uh, where, where are we at with these things? Uh, it, well, essentially, um, Thanksgiving cactus, Christmas cactus. Uh, there was an old English name, um, crab cactus, presumably from the fact that the stems had sort of somewhat spiky tips to the joints. Um, they are all different ways of describing plants uh, within what is now the genus Schlumbergera. Um and primarily, the plants that you see in cultivation nowadays are cultivars um, of an autumn flowering species called Schlumbergera truncata. Uh, that was one of the earliest that was imported into the country in the early 1800s. And initially, it was grown as a stove plant, um, and it was gradually realized that it would tolerate a rather wider range of conditions than that. But essentially, uh, as new imports came in, they had different colour versions. um, And so uh, there there was a constant supply of novelties, shall we say, from the Christmas, sorry, from the um, Schlumberger truncata, the autumn flowering species. Um, As people explored Brazil more, they discovered there was a very closely related species called Schlumberger rosseliana, which is um, smaller, neater, uh, has regular shaped flowers, more pendant than Schlumbergera truncata, and that flowers um, in the spring. And somebody in about the 1840s had the idea of trying to cross those two. And it was that cross which actually produced the thing which is was originally called the Christmas cactus. Um, pretty obviously, you cross an autumn flowering species with a spring flowering species, and guess what? You get a Christmas a cactus flowering in the middle. Um, so the Christmas cactus strictly is the name for the hybrids uh, that flower 
around Christmas time. And one of the perennial questions that I see and probably you see is that uh, people say, well, why doesn't my Christmas cactus flower at Christmas? And, and the answer to that is probably because what, you're, what they have bought and what they're growing is not actually a Christmas cactus, but a cultivar of the autumn flowering species. Um, and so that, that's why they flower October, November time generally. Ah, okay. So that's where the what that's where the Thanksgiving things comes exactly. in. So, so let me get this. So that would be a, a, a some kind of Schomburgera truncata hybrid, as Cult, opposed well, cultivar, to cultivar, usually cultivar, cultivar or of, possibly back cross, because these things have been hybridised now for 150 years, and so possibly there is a bit of Schlumbergera rasseliana in the things that are still being sold nowadays. Um, but as you'll know, they they start. Um, being sold quite early on in the autumn. And I guess that's a commercial imperative to try and get the plants saleable as quickly as possible. And for the same reason, Truncata is, is generally preferred by, I think, the horticultural trade because it tends to be um, a, a larger, more robust plant. It um, flowers on young plants, uh, which can be kept compact and packed tightly in polystyrene trays. The uh, tr other species, Russelliana, and even the hybrids, uh, primary hybrids that flower Christmas time, they tend to dangle more, and they do not, therefore, lend themselves to presentation in the same way. And I think that's probably why they have fallen out of um, commercial favour. That's really interesting. Two things spring to mind as a result of what you said. Going back a bit, explain what a stove plant is, if you wouldn't mind. I'm not entirely certain. It was it was a term used for plants that were kept in um, heated conditions in a conservatory or greenhouse. I think. Yeah, I guess you're. Yeah, the old the old stove heated Victorian conservatory. Exactly. I suppose is what that, I'm. That's my understanding of it. Anyway, I, I've okay. just heard the term used in relation to these plants. Yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. And second question. So we've we've established the kind of Thanksgiving slash Christmas cactus situation where does the easter cactus fit that in if a, at all again a hybrid uh, produced by two species of ripsalidopsis now the, the distinction between schlumbergera and Rups, ripsalidopsis um, has been confused by taxonomists over the years but uh, if you ignore what's happened in the past um, which it makes life an awful lot simpler there are two species of ripsalidopsis a small one called ripsalidopsis rosea with pink flowers rather pretty little thing um and a spe the other species uh ripsalidopsis gartneri which has is larger and has larger orange flowers and again these two species were hybridized to create the plants that are now known as easter cacti um, commercially, which come in a variety of colours, reflecting the fact that the parents had different colours as well. Now, these plants, uh, whether you've got Easter, Christmas or Thanksgiving versions or species or cultivars, they all are treated in a kind of similar way. But if you want them to flower, there are a few tricks and, and tips for getting them to flower. Um I think a lot of people buy these plants in bud, bring them home and the buds all fall off. <laughs> yes. um, I think many of us have been through that experience yep. too. So first, what's what's the way of avoiding that? If you go out and buy a lovely um, Christmas cactus or Easter cactus in bud and you bring it home, what's the best way of avoiding that tragic moment when the buds are all on the floor? Well, it may be too late by the time you get it. Um, I, there, there was a, a view some some years ago that you had to um, keep the plant facing the same way while the buds were growing and that if you tried to turn it round, the buds would somehow twist themselves to try and face the light or whatever and fall off. Uh, that, I think, is, is completely untrue. Uh, I actually deliberately tried uh, doing this with a plant which had 200 buds and I turned it 180 degrees to see what would happen and absolutely nothing happened. So I'm convinced that that, that ah. isn't a problem. I think the problem is probably more that these things are grown really quickly in pretty much ideal conditions of temperature and relatively high humidity uh, in, in greenhouses. And then as soon as the buds start to appear, 
they are prepared for uh, selling to people and the, in that process they are often transported in conditions which are very very different to how they first grew and uh, the shock simply the shock of the cold the wind or or whatever it w is enough to cause the what are really very young little more than cuttings um, to, to just lose their buds. So I think really it's more a question of how the plants have been stored prior to when people get them. Mm, yeah, that's. I think that's a good point. And obviously if the flowers do fall off, then it doesn't mean the plant's going to die. It just means you've got to wait yep. a while to yep. get you, you have to <laughs> back wait for to another that flowering year, yeah. point. Um, but it, it, it's possible that you can do something. I, one, because as I said, one of the... Um, conditions that they, they will be grown in is, is relatively high humidity and stillish air. Um, one of the things you can do when you bring them home is to try and recreate that as, as far as you can. So not put them in drafts. Um, and, and if you can increase the humidity around the plants, either by regular spraying or even in extreme cases, put them in plastic bags um, to, to just in, which will, will um, help both with the humidity and cutting down drafts. That, that will sometimes rescue a plant, but of course, then you don't see it as well. So it, it, that's not a long-term solution properly for these plants. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's the thing, isn't it? You're sort of uh, biting off your nose to spite your face in that scenario. But let's talk about uh, how to get these plants to flower again because I think this is the one that, that really stump, uh, stumps people. In my all-time favourite houseplant book, Dr. David Hesseon's Houseplant <laughs> Expert, there's a, there's a diagram, which I don't know if it's, if it's still considered to be correct, but there's a wonderful, it's kind of like a chart, which tells you what to do with your Easter, Christmas, Thanksgiving cactus at different times of the year to get it to flower. This is kind of, it, it makes it look kind of complicated, but it, if you follow through the months it does kind of make sense is there any kind of simplified version you can give us on how to to keep these plants happy throughout the year and then get them to flower again well i think the first thing to remember is that they are epiphytic plants by nature and so they are not used to um bright light and the other thing is that they are not actually particularly good if with too much heat either so i would say at no point in the year do you want to stick these things in the sun and at no time of the year do you really want to try and overheat them either they they actually will tolerate quite low temperatures so you need to find a position ideally um reasonable light but definitely not direct sunlight um and somewhere where it will be warmer in the day perhaps cooler at night um, and and the plants will pretty much do the job for themselves as long as they are in a, a reasonable open organic compost then uh, in which you you keep moist but not sodden um, as i say the plants will pretty much grow themselves in, in if you've got it right um, then usually after the flowering period of flowering is over they won't do a lot for a few months over the winter uh, but then you should see small new stem sections appearing from the tips of the ones that were on the plant when you got it uh, out from about April onwards. And there will be one, maybe two flushes of growth um, during the spring and early summer. And then there may be a bit of a lull again as buds start to appear at the tips of the probably the new stem sections mostly um, and those will grow during the late summer until depending on which plant you've got um, they will start to flower again in the, either the autumn winter or, or early spring so i don't i don't really see it as, as, as any as needing any magic it's more just a question of just fitting in with the plant's natural cycle yeah that's i guess that's the thing isn't it it will naturally coordinate with the seasons and the day length and so on to, to flower at the right moment which is the ideal thing you mentioned there about the compost what what kind of potting mix do these epiphytes need i'm kind of always thinking that i'm possibly over potting them in too large a pot because actually probably that i imagine their root balls are not that big 
Is there any particular recipe you recommend for the potting mix? In terms of a recipe, um, no. The essential feature, I think, is that it should be organic base, um, obviously, because if you think about what's happening to them in nature, they're living primarily up trees where um, they they live on dead leaves, dead twigs, all held uh, bits of bits of um, bird droppings, or even birds themselves or insects uh, all bound up really with moss growth and um, so what and the, and the plants are actually rooting straight into that and so really you try and mimic that by giving them maybe a mixture of um, chopped bark and coir or something like that but the actual uh, you can add um, perlite vermiculite um, you can also add all sorts of things it doesn't really matter as long as you end up with something that is water retaining but at the same time has plenty of air spaces because these plants really don't like although they don't tolerate drying out very well um, they don't like being waterlogged either so an open spongy organic compost is what you're after Um, after after christmas sometimes i've tried uh, actually drying out um, old christmas trees and chucking old christmas tree needles in as well it doesn't it really doesn't matter i've tried different mixes and i can't see that there is that much in it um it, it's it's the texture that's important oh that's that's good to know there's there's obviously different options because i think sometimes we can get terribly tied up and think oh i must have exactly these proportions of perlite to vermiculite to john in his number two and panic about these things you're absolutely right i don't think it's important at all i really don't and indeed I, with some species, it, it, I have found that actually they, they are better off not in soil at all. I, I grow the uh, Schlumbergera raceliana that I mentioned to you earlier, the small spring flowering um, Schlumbergera. Uh, I grow that on the outside of um, porous clay pots that are filled with water inside. And so you have it, it's essentially just a, cil- a clay cylinder. Um, and I, I wrap moss around the outside and plant the plants straight on into the moss. There is no soil at all. Oh, that's really interesting. I'd love to see a picture of that, Mark, because that sounds very intriguing. How do you how do you secure the plant to I the use moss? Fine fishing line, oh, nylon okay. fishing line. Um, I imagine you could do it. It, it can be quite fiddly, um, but I imagine you could do it with copper wire or something like that much more easily. But I was never quite sure whether uh, the copper would adversely affect the growth of moss, because essentially what you're doing here is keeping the moss happy for as long as possible. And if you keep the moss happy, the plants will be happy. So there's you're just filling up that central reservoir with water yep. and that's obviously soaking through its porous and then the plants on the outside with the moss. Yep. And is that sitting on a shelf or hanging, hanging. or how is that? So far, the only ones I've used have, have had um, three. I, the ones I've bought have had um, three holes drilled uh, at intervals around the top. And so you can hang them from um, a, an overhead bar or something like that. And in fact, uh, I now have an automatic solar power watering system that keeps them topped up so I can go away in the summer, which is nice. But yes, I can give you a picture of that. No problem. Yeah, that would be that would be really interesting to see because I can't quite visualise it. But um, I'm yeah, I'm really and I guess ideal, as you say, for an epiphyte, it sounds perfect. It's getting that regular supply of moisture, but it's not surrounded in claggy compost. Exactly so. Is... And I think to go back to your earlier point about um, overpotting. That can be an issue because, as you say, the root ball, well, the roots are can be extensive, but there's not a ma- um, a massive lump of root, uh, and they don't need a large amount of compost. I think there's much more chance that they will end up getting uh, too much water, particularly in the centre, if you put them in too large a pot. And they are actually better off, uh, particularly the Ripsalidopsis, the Easter cacti, I would say, are particularly, um, it's particularly important not to give them too large a pot and uh, to to keep them on the drier side rather than um, the wetter side. The the important thing is actually not too much water, but the humidity that, that really helps them because it slows down the rate at which they lose water. Let's talk about humidity. Are we talking about a, a, a greenhouse fug or are we talking about sort of 50% or what's an ideal 
humidity level for these plants? Do, can you give us I a think guide? It's the, <laughs> the plants will tell you. It's probably more than an average house would would have. Um, and that's particularly an issue, of course, in the winter when central heating tends to be turned on because there's less water in the air. Um, you heat it up and that creates a suction effect on uh, your hot, dry air, creates a suction effect on on the plants. And so that is when they are actually most at risk, particularly if they're anywhere near radiators or anything like that. Um, the ways around it could be putting them in a tray, or standing them on a tray of gravel, which is kept moist, I suppose, or um, perhaps squirting a bit of water at them now and then. But ideally, try and keep the temperature down um, so that they are not actually being baked and, and having all the water sucked out of them too fast. Uh, the a, probably a spare room or something like that. If you want to grow them as house plants, um, a spare room at a lower temperature is probably better than a main living room. I would, I would say. This must be why all of our our grandparents had such beautiful. Uh, well, perhaps not, perhaps I'm exaggerating here, but I think I hear from a lot of people saying, "Oh yes, my nana or my grandma had a beautiful Christmas cactus," and I'm imagining that you know back. Back in the day when we didn't have central heating and, and ha homes were generally, or certainly at night time, any heating there was was turned off. Perhaps these plants were happier back then to some extent because they weren't getting blasted by dr hot, dry air all winter. Absolutely right. Uh, and that's why why we had these magnificent plants from our grandparents' generation. I think they, they last much better like that because they're under much less stress. And I have to say that although I do grow some of these still indoors all year round um, most of them do benefit from being outside under trees and just exposed to the elements um, during the summer um, and even the ones that don't I, I will try and and manage their conditions so that they are not just getting too hot at any point so yes I think um, as, as people were growing them 50 years ago probably is would be better for them than how many people will be trying to grow them nowadays, particularly in living rooms. Another question that came in from a listener was about artificial light and the Christmas cactus. Now, I think you kind of already alluded to this already, but um, Steve wanted to know about, he's heard that artificial light will stop or limit the Christmas cactus's ability to flower. I've heard tales of not putting them in a window facing a street light to ensure full bloomage. I've heard that too. Oh, don't let it have any extra light after after the sun's gone down. Is it really that sens light sensitive that that could make a difference? I don't know. Uh, is the easy answer to that one? I would say that because well, the Christmas cat. If we're talking, sorry about if we're talking about Schlumbergeras, um, they flower in the autumn and the, the hybrids flower over the following few months. Uh, they are short day plants and the buds do start to appear as the days get shorter. So I would imagine that anything that mimics longer days may inhibit or slow down bud production. That's, that's fairly common in, in a number of different plants. But how sensitive um, any particular plant would be to any particular light source, I guess, depends on what sort of uh, light source it is and how close it is to the plants. I would have I would also say that window sills are not actually always the best place for these things anyway for reasons that we've discussed earlier. You know, you certainly mm -hmm. don't want to put them in a win on a window sill where they will get direct sun because they will roast. Yeah, I mean I get with the old um br bright indirect light might be might be applicable to these to these uh, particular plants. No direct sun, but plenty of light that that, that isn't going to burn them. Is that is that about the length of it? I, th I think so. Uh, they they will tolerate quite a lot of shade, and again, the sort of conditions that people were giving them in cottages and so on um, may mean that they continue to grow into quite big plants, um, but possibly quite lanky plants. Um, nowadays, people don't necessarily have the space for the, for a Christmas cactus that's four or five feet across on their dining room table. But, <laughs> um, so so there possibly a bit more light than that helps in that case. But there is this problem that bright light um, and 
possibly it's not the light itself, but the heat that results from from the bright light, particularly if they're near to a window pl- pane, um, could could cause them to overheat, uh, and then the stems will will shrivel quite fast. Thanks so much to Mark. He'll be back next week to talk about other members of the epiphytic cactus clan, including the wonderful Rip Salis. Now it's time for question of the week, which comes from Alison. Alison wants to know why her mature spider plants has plantlets that are themselves putting out new plantlets. Will this grandmothering happen further? Well, I love the term grandmothering. <laughs> Not heard that one before. Chlorophytum commosum or the spider plant, that much loved house plant, which I will be dedicating a whole episode to in the future, is such a wonderful plant because partly because of its wonderful habit of putting out all of these stolons. A stolon is just a fancy word for a plant stem or runner that kind of goes sideways out of the pot as per strawberries, if you've ever grown those and creates these baby plants, which I've recently heard described as spiderettes. What a great name. I want to be in a band called the Spiderettes. Anyway, the plant puts out these babies. And as Alison has pointed out, sometimes the babies have babies themselves. So a baby spider plant that's still attached to the main plant will then start creating its own stolon and you'll get a plantlet or a spiderette attached to another spiderette attached to the parent plant. So Alison wants to know whether this is going to keep happening. And the answer is quite frankly, yes, it will keep happening until you've got this incredible chandelier of a spider plant with many, many babies attached. And really, the only limiting factor is when these start hitting the ground, I guess, you will get or the plant becomes too heavy. And that's probably the point when you need to start taking a few of these stolons off. You'll find that if you leave them on there long enough, they will develop their own root systems, these spiderettes or plantlets, before they're even put into any potting mix. And once they've done that, they really are simple to propagate. You can just snip off the stolon and pot them up into some potting compost on their own and they will go away nicely. If you find that you snip off plantlets without any roots and they struggle, the other thing you can do is fill a pot with potting compost, place it next to the parent plant and pin a plantlet still attached to the parent plant by the stolon into that pot with, say, something like a, a paper clip that you've unfolded and turned into a U-shape. Pin that plantlet in there and allow it to grow on while still attached to the parent plant and getting nutrients from it. Once that's established, you can then snip away the stolon. You'll usually find that if your plant is not producing any stolons, it probably means that it's got a lot of growing to do in terms of its own root ball and isn't quite ready to start reproducing yet. But these are very, very generous plants with their vegetative propagation. So generally, most plants will produce plantlets from quite a young age, as Alison has seen with the plantlets on plantlets on plantlets. So these endlessly generous plants are wonderful. If you can give the plantlets away to family and friends, please do so. But don't feel bad also about sticking them on the compost heap because, let's face it, you could be getting hundreds of baby plants off your spider plant. If you've got a story about a spider plant you'd like to share for my spider plant special episode coming up, please do drop me a line. Or perhaps you've got a question for On The Ledge. Either way, I'm at ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. That wraps up this week's show. I'm off to bask in the glorious light of my new grow light, about which I shall tell you more in future weeks. But for the moment, plant people, have a great week. Bye. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin, and O oh Mallory by Josh Woodward. The ad music was Dill Pickles by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. All the music in this week's show is licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details. <laughs>